In Baldur's Gate 3, you can become nearly anyone, from a hero who rescues the weak, all the way up to becoming a psychopath who collects his victim's limbs. The game seemingly has it all, but in a world where everyone wants you dead, is it possible to maintain your innocence? And can you beat Baldur's Gate 3 without killing anything? Because we aren't killing anything, the best character for avoiding any accidental murders is Dwaygar, due to their near permanent invisibility once reaching level 5. Sorcerer, because they're a charisma class with good spells like fog and enhanced jumping, and stats wise we max out our strength for increased jump distance, constitution for more health, and charisma to be able to talk more better. And since clearly a person who never defends himself cannot be intelligent nor wise, I think the stats fit the roleplay perfectly. After assigning all of our skills, we wake up on a burning nautiloid ship and meet our hyper-aggressive ally who immediately decides now is the time for murder. She then initiated combat with these imps. However, because imps are people too, we cannot kill them. Instead, I just use my improved jumping skills to leap away from danger, because these enemies are really not that difficult to evade. Then we continue to casually hop away all the way to the Nautiloid's controls, only to be immediately attacked by a dragon which forced the ship to crash. So it's not my fault that hundreds of innocents died on the ship, the dragon was the perpetrator. With the tutorial complete, now is probably a good time to explain what qualifies as killing. For the purposes of this challenge, if my characters or anything I control deal damage and cause them to die, that would be killing. Even if it's a cutscene, even if it's a summoned creature I control, that's still killing. If you disagree with me on these rules, that's okay. Feel free to dislike the video. With the rules made clear, let's begin. A normal player would start the game by immediately killing tons of innocent things in order to level up. But since we're a pacifist, in order to get that experience we have a few limited options, including exploration, dialogues, and quests which avoid combat. So I grabbed what little exploration experience is available and I decided that I could use an ally. But after taking a look at which allies are available in this game, I have to say that most of them seem pretty murdery. So I decided to go with Gale because he's kind of just a chill dude. One of the best parts about Baldur's Gate 3 is that there's very little that you're forced to do. In fact, in Act 1, there's only one fight that a player is actually forced into, which occurs when you walk towards the Druid's Grove. However, by using our massive jumping bonus, we can jump around the combat trigger and avoid being involved. Yes, people will die, but I will have nothing to do with it. My party let the altercation play out and then proceeded into the town to chat up some locals to bring us to level 2. After checking out the grove and picking up some new threads, I walked over to the abandoned village while disguised as a drow to scare some pathetic goblins to get to level 3. Now is probably a good time to mention that the main story of Act 1 is basically just a battle between the goblins and the tieflings, and since we are not killers, we will be abstaining from taking any sides. Meaning technically, we could just walk directly out of Act 1 and into Act 2, skipping literally everything. But I needed to be a higher level to have a realistic chance later on in the challenge, so Gale and I spent the next 5 hours doing every single thing that I could find as long as it didn't involve hurting anybody, which is now being condensed into this short 15 second montage on screen. During that time I had also picked up a thief hireling so I could lockpick and pickpocket easily. The most interesting non-combat experience bonus I found was that you can get experience for crafting the mithril armor in Grimford without entering combat by shooting the wheel with a bow. Just don't ask me to explain how the physics on that one works. I wrapped up basically every non-combat quest in Act 1 and then moved on to the mountain pass. Entering the monastery and persuading the gift to let me in was enough to get me up to level 5 and unlock the Dwegar's racial for near permanent invisibility which allows me to pull off any stealth quest, such as stealing the Gith Yankee's eggs, a lot simpler. I talked to the rest of the Gith for the remaining experience, broke the Zaphist, acquired the blood of Lathander, and used some dwarven powers to skip the undead that blocked the path to the Shadowlands, thus completing Act 1 at level 5 without entering combat. But Act 2 is where this challenge's difficulty really steps up, because there's almost no available quests, and there are some mandatory combat encounters that require some creativity in order to bypass them. But firstly, I need a way to stop dying from the Shadow Curse, a debuff which constantly hurts you when you're in the dark. Ordinarily, you would have to do battle with or against this Drider to get a Moon Lantern, which grants you protection against the curse. Since that is not an option, I decided to head directly to Moonrise Towers through the Shadow Cursed Lands. Once again, we used our empowered jumping abilities to jump through the area and managed to avoid dying to the Shadow Curse. Once we're inside Moonrise Towers, we're given our own Moon Lantern. Additionally, we're given the task to find Balthazar and the Night Song. So from here, I decided to pick up another companion, Minthara, who has been captured and held in the basement of the tower. Look, I know she's a brutal, empathyless killer but I can fix her. Plus, she rewards a little bit of experience for being saved. With the Moon Lantern in hand, I could now go anywhere I wanted to gather as much experience as I could before continuing the main quest to find Balthazar. It's pretty well known by many at this point that the major bosses of Act 2, including this one, can be killed through dialogues, which is not combat. But in my opinion, killing them this way still invalidates the challenge, because in the real world, giving the legal defense that you only told them to off themselves probably wouldn't fly. So instead of killing the boss, I instead give her 6,000 gold. Doing this grants 
princess the same 1100 experience that I would have gotten from killing her, but now I don't have to. Next, I played hide and seek with a demon child and helped an edgy raven man find a book. But beyond that, there really wasn't a lot of experience to be found, not even half a level. So I was forced to continue the main story. My party ventured into the mausoleum, solved the painting puzzle, and descended into Shaw's temple. Once inside, we used fog to bypass a puzzle and continued while invisible. This is the room where we will find Balthazar. And here's the thing. We need something to happen to Balthazar, because Balthazar is a dick, and he's gonna mess up my plans if he follows me further into the temple. But I'm not gonna be the one to deal with him. I won't even be involved in the battle. You see, normally, when this door here is clicked, you'll get a message that the door is locked, and it immediately starts a fight, which you have to win. Then your buddy Balthazar will come out and unlock the door for you, but we're gonna change that up a little bit. I got Gale to cast the spell Knock, which unlocks the door from a distance, and then I snuck up my main character, and now I can open the door, which immediately starts combat. But because I I'm invisible, I'm not pulled into the fight, leaving Balthazar to defend himself. Which is kind of karma, because normally, he just cowers behind the door and never helps you while you do all the work. Handling the situation like this lets me keep my hands clean. I don't have to kill anyone. It's a bad day for our friend Balthazar. With this necromancer out of the way, we needed to tackle the Temple of Shah's Gauntlet and complete the trials within. The first trial is a test of stealth, which if you've been watching this video, you'll know that's all I've been doing. I breezed through the trial and collected the reward, an umbral gem. The second trial, however, is a problem because it requires killing a clone of myself in order to pass the trial. Not gonna work. So let's continue with what I can do for now. The third trial is to pass an invisible maze. It's got the maze posted at the door here on the ground, but I don't like doing the maze, so I just jumped and cheesed it like everybody else does. The last gem that we can acquire is here near Jurger, who we do have the option to persuade into killing others but I think that considers controlling him. So instead of doing that, I cast the fog spell, snuck into the room, and stole the gem. Ordinarily, the game requires you to have four of these umbral gems in order to complete Shaw's gauntlet. One for this elevator, followed by three more to open this door. But we cannot get four unless we kill something. Luckily for us, there's a way to skip the elevator. If you stand in this exact spot, you can get someone to buff you with fly, and then you can fly down there, totally skipping the elevator and the only gem that would have required me to kill someone. I place the three gems into position and open the door to the Night Song's prison. Once inside the prison, we can free the Night Song. This is also where you would have normally had to fight Balthazar if you wanted to free her, but because he had an unfortunate accident, no one is here to stop us. With just a slight touch on the Night Song, she she is free, and she takes off on her mission to kill Catherick Thorne, the big bad villain of Act 2. I set off to Moonrise Towers to meet her there, and used invisibility to bypass all the major battles. From here, you get to have a conversation with Catherick Thorne, and by passing two extremely high rolls, he actually surrenders, without doing any combat. But unfortunately, Aelin, the Night Song, is kind of a vengeful bitch and so she forces Catherick to do combat. Meaning for the first time since the tutorial, we're actually forced to participate in a battle, and we cannot run. But we do have someone else in this fight, someone who I don't control, someone who is going to do all of the work and get her hands bloody. On my turn, I used the haste spell on Aelin to give her an additional action point, and then I threw an invisibility potion on her as well so that nobody can mess with her, followed by running away. She then got her first turn, ran up, and absolutely trucked Catherick for 80 damage in one turn, which caused him and the Night Song to both flee the battle. Then I just used my invisibility spell to escape the rest of the fight, and once again, no one has died. My party took pursuit and followed them into the Mind Flayer colony. This colony does have one fight that we can talk our way out of for bonus XP, and then after that, we're off to face Catherick. Because my party is so underleveled, I spent a few minutes casting every single buff I could find in my spellbooks, took a trip down an elevator, watched some Power Ranger cosplay, then spent 10 minutes positioning my characters perfectly. Once again, I convinced Catherick to surrender, but instead, he just skips phase 1 and turns Super Saiyan whatever you call this thing. So with Catherick transformed, the battle begins. I got my dog Scratch to help Aelin stand up, and then buffed Aelin as much as I could, with haste, invisibility potions, blessings, basically anything I have available, because she's going to be the murderer here. What makes this fight challenging is that when she's standing near the boss, I cannot heal her, due to the necrotic aura that the boss has. The fight was actually going very smooth. She was absolutely absolutely destroying the boss, and I was in a solid position until I messed up and accidentally cancelled my concentration spell with haste on her, thus stunning her, when she was one shot from death and standing in an area immune to healing. Instead of giving up, I used Minthara to cast taunt on the boss and then threw an invisibility potion on Aelin. An enemy ran up and used the spell detect invisibility, and I began to sweat, because if she died, this is all over. But somehow, she resisted it, and then landed a killing blow on Catherick, finally leveling my characters to 6 by the way, and completing the final boss of Act 2. Our party collected Catherick's Netherstone, and after leaving the colony, Jahira offers to join the party, which we gladly accept because she joins us at level 8. We continue to 
up the road towards Baldur's Gate, took a rest at camp, got ambushed in our sleep by aliens, and then walked past all the enemies as usual. The next part of the challenge involved dealing with the jump ability and trying to make my characters actually go where I tell them to. Why is this still so annoying? This next encounter involves a battle with some crazy Githyanki. Once again, we have an ally who is going to do the dirty work for us. The Emperor, a friendly mind flayer who has been protecting us. And now, it's our turn to protect him. I cast haste on the Emperor and then focused my remaining turns spamming hold monster, command, and taunts in order to keep the Githyanki ambushers stunned long enough for the Emperor to get them all down. Compared to our last encounter, this one was incredibly easy. I accepted the Emperor's offer to evolve, and then continued down the road to Baldur's Gate. I started Act 3 by adopting an orphan child, before beginning our quest to acquire the other two Netherstones in order to take down the Elder Brain. First stop, the circus, to feed a dinosaur and spin a wheel to win a grand prize trip to the jungle. I decided I'd need to keep doing side quests like these in order to hopefully get above level 6 and a higher health pool because 44 HP is one-shottable by basically anything in this game. Next I fed a Mind Flare, reunited Gale with his cat owl friend, and because I've not been killing anything, I was allowed by the guards to enter Baldur's Gate's main city, which you're normally denied entry to if you've been a bit of a naughty boy. Reading a bloodstained letter brought the party up to level 7 just in time to witness a Final Fantasy character's coronation ceremony. We struck an alliance with this handsome young man. The terms of this alliance were made clear. We will do no harm to each other as long as I deal with Orin and bring her netherstone to him. I made a pit stop at the prison, helped an old friend escape jail, and pushed into Baldur's Gate's sewers, where we'll now have to address the psychopath murderer elephant in the room, Orin. In order to progress further into the game, Orin has to die, and this time there is no ally to help me battle Orin. So the challenge is a fail, right? Not exactly. I'll explain how we can use some clever game mechanics to bypass this problem. Because Orin is a shapeshifter, she will sometimes appear to the player disguised, and in the sewers, she will appear to the player disguised as a kidnapped companion. However, if you have no kidnappable companions, then Orin will appear to you as the orphan child we adopted earlier. Walking towards this door triggers Orin to immediately run up to the player and start a conversation while she is still disguised. During that conversation, she will reveal her true self and taunt you and say how she's so much better than you and blah 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 who cares shut up Orin. Okay, we're just gonna reload back a second before that conversation happened. This time, you're gonna take the artifact that you received in Act 1, the item which is normally useless, and place it into the one key on your hotbar. Then, you approach that same spot to trigger Orin coming to talk to you, but this time spamming the one key. This basically says, nope, sorry Orin, this box is more important than you. This ignores her conversation, leaving Orin stuck, shapeshifted here as a child. And much like in real life, Baldur's Gate's children are weak and bad at fighting. From here, you can just ignore her and continue on with your life. Once again, we use the best racial in the game to sneak past everything in the sewers and straight into Ball's Temple. The next question you might be asking is how do you plan to get past the door which requires killing someone to get it to open? Well, if you stand back here by the waypoint and then click on the door, your character will proceed along the path and walk directly through this so-called solid door. Alternatively, you could just cast Misty Step and go right through the door. So it's not really much of a door at all. Now if you look where Orin is normally standing, you'll see that she is still shapeshifted as a child. Up until this point in this challenge, I have never even dealt one damage to anyone. In all the previous fights, I avoided dealing damage. Unfortunately, this is where that has to end. There is currently no known way to get Orin's Netherstone without dealing damage to her. But luckily for us, this is not a no damage run, this is a no killing run. And Larian was nice enough to give us a non-lethal damage toggle. Because Orin is still shapeshifted as a child, she only has 5 health, so we only need to deal 5 damage to knock her unconscious, allowing us to acquire her netherstone without killing her. Even her nearby guards will still comment that Orin is still very much alive. Obtaining Orin's netherstone granted a large chunk of experience, so I returned to the city, lied to some loser from Act 1, causing him to run away crying, and then gave us a lot more experience, enough to get my party to level 8. This is probably high enough to continue the challenge, but since I went through all of Act 1 and Act 2 and I didn't skip anything, I may as well figure out just how high of a level you can get by not killing anything. Which in case you're wondering, it roughly added 8 additional hours of playtime to the playthrough, only 2 of which were loading screens. Isn't Act 3 fun? Having just barely edged out level 9, and having Jahira at level 10, I'm pretty sure that this will be the highest level you can achieve in the game, at least when you're following this masochistic rule set. With the unasked questions answered, I met with Gortash and discussed our alliance once again, only to learn he refuses to ally with me, and he attacks me on sight. I spammed F8 and thought about what went wrong. The original alliance that I'd made with Gortash was to bring the Netherstone and kill Orin. Somehow Gortash knows that Orin is not dead, so he will not continue our alliance. But in order to finish the game, I need his Netherstone without myself killing him. Also, the non-lethal damage trick won't work this time because Gortash is a bit of a pro gamer, and he has his Netherstone embedded into his armor. For legal reasons, in Baldur's Gate 3, you 
you cannot remove someone's equipped armor when they're unconscious. After some thinking, I reworked my party's classes and confronted Gortash once more in his office. This encounter has no additional allies with me who I can use to do my dirty work for me. So the one who will be killing Gortash this time will be Gortash. For this pro gamer has set up defensive turrets, which will shoot explosives at anyone who walks nearby. The plan? Cast Sanctuary, which makes me untargetable, allowing me to keep moving near Gortash so the explosives will finish him off. That was the plan anyways, until a few turns in when Gortash goes immune to all of these damage types. And then they killed me. Plan failed. At this point, I panicked a bit. I didn't know what to do. Did I really just waste over 20 hours of my life on this playthrough and I can't even finish it? Am I a loser? Yes. So I revived and tried again. This time, the plan was to throw shit at the wall and see what sticks. I spammed crown controls on everything I could, set up Gortash with his own explosives, and then something completely unexpected happened. The explosives didn't actually kill Gortash, but they brought him down to 95 health points. But that same explosion got Gortash's robot guards down to 1 health, which triggered it to auto-cast the spell Self-Detonation. Because of the turn order, Gortash couldn't move away from this, and the Steel Watch Guard exploded, dealing 98 damage, killing him right before he could get his immunity buff active. This was insanely lucky. I grabbed his Netherstone and continued to do what I'd been doing best, running away like a coward. With all the nether stones in my positions, I went shopping for some overpriced and overpowered scrolls, rested up at camp, took a swim, and confronted the Elder Brain. After some pathetic Kamehamehas, I was put in my place and teleported to another world by Squidward. Thankful for saving our life, we handed the nether stones to our tentacle-faced friend, returned to the real world, and found that Baldur's Gate was being destroyed by the giant brain. You probably know what's coming next at this point. I went invisible, skipped all the battles, chugged even more invisibility potions, and then ascended the brain with a fully invisible party so that combat would not be initiated. My invisible party made its way up to the crown, and I used a scroll to cast the Globe of Invulnerability spell, which makes everyone inside of the globe immune to all incoming damage. This was able to buy enough time for Squidward to channel the Triforce and open the portal to the brain. We entered the inner sanctum of the nether brain, the final boss. This wouldn't be a playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3 if at some point I didn't use explosive barrels to cheese a fight. So for the entire game, I have been stockpiling explosives for this specific point in time, but I won't be the one detonating these explosives. We're gonna let the brain do it. During the Elder Brain's fight, it will repeatedly cast an explosive orb spell, which detonates and destroys the platforms in the room. But what if we let the brain summon this orb and then load up the platform full of explosives? Well, then that wouldn't be me doing it. That would be the brain causing the explosion. It would be the brain that will end its own life. The brain did its thing, I moved into position, placed the payload, quick save so I could relive the moment anytime I want, and I sat back to enjoy the fireworks. Three, two, one, and the game crashed. At least I saved. So I reloaded, and after about 15 minutes of testing to figure out why it kept crashing, I found if you placed the explosives on a different platform that's not being destroyed, then the game wouldn't crash. The brain did his self-destruction, and I beat Baldur's Gate 3 without killing anything. I've wanted to do a challenge video like this in a game for years, and I'm so glad that I finally got to do one. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like. If you have any questions, leave a comment. I read every single comment on this channel, and as always, thanks for watching. Proxy out.